All right, thank you, Harold. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you all. Uh, I'll go ahead and first say I've got a little bit of head cold, so if you hear some extra nasal kind of thing, I won't cough on you, I promise. But uh, So I'll be sucking on a lozenge every now and then. Uh, but with that, uh, if you haven't heard me talk before, I want to have a conversation. So this should be some pretty good uh, information just to have an understanding of how uh, we're coming along with some of the sulfur issues that are popping on soybeans. Um, over the last few years, we've had some pretty remarkable responses. If you had asked me about four years ago, four or five years ago, okay, do we need to worry about sulfur on soybeans? My answer would be no. I mean, sulfur is needed. There's no doubt about it. It's macronutrient, and we need it in large amounts. But it's in terms of something that we want to fertilize for, I really haven't seen much response at all. And so as you think about it, um, the crops that we grow in the Midwest, I mean, the top ones are going to be more your grass crops. Uh, wheat's going to be at the top. Corn's going to be falling. And soybeans really haven't been on the list at all. So it's kind of exciting that we are seeing some of these responses. Um, and I want to kind of walk through the whys because there's certainly responses that are no, no response, that we put it out, there's no response. I know that Harold and others have talked about this over in Ohio that you guys have looked at it or you've had some other sources that you've been looking at gypsum for a while. Uh, go ahead and put that in context as if you've looked at this or you want to look at it, uh, where you might be responsive. Okay? So if you think about responsive sites to sulfur, how would you characterize those fields? What would you say that was the key characteristics? Low organic matter. Low organic matter. So what's low organic matter for you guys? Less than 1%. Okay, I've given this talk all winter long, and there's people say 3% is low for them. So just understand. <laughs> exactly, right? So uh, um, 2% uh, gets, uh, I hit that one a fair amount, but yeah, I, I say ones, right? And certainly lower. All right, so lower grain can matter. What else? Sandy soils. So the coarse texture, right? So sandy soils. Why, why is that, guys? Leachability. So you already have that appreciation that sulfur, in the form that we want it, sulfate, moves through the soil. And so more or less, if you want to just kind of put it on a quick parallel, think about it like nitrate. Okay, so it moves through fairly quick. So that's the classic. All right. Near the end of today's talk, I'm going to show you fields that go against that norm. The flat blacks that I grew up on, I grew up in Illinois, on 4% organic matter flats. Right? And we've got responses on those. And, and that's in a different class. So what I'm really going to share today is sulfur deficient fields and then situationally deficient sulfur. Okay? And that, that's kind of what I want to get into. All right? So with that, as you make decisions for yield uh, of soybeans, you can switch that to economics for that matter. Um, what are the top decisions that you are making for yield production, yield management of soybeans? This is the classic, your 101 soybean management, right? What's at the top? Variety. Man, you've seen this talk before, right? Variety selection. And so dare I say, we're starting to scratch in the surface of where the corn boys have looked at nitrogen rates on corn and said, oh, there's different nitrogen, optimum nitrogen rates based on your hybrid. I'm not saying that there is or isn't. I'm just, that's another twist that's starting to come out of some of the last year's worth of data. Okay, variety selection, all right? Maybe some of this comes into the yield potential as well, okay? Uh, what's the next uh, top management decision? Cis, planting rate, what else? Treatment, fertility, all those who are coming in to play the next talks on planting dates, so I'll give a prop to timely planting for carry. All right, so that's been a huge one. Again, I grew up in Illinois, so it was get corn in the ground, then you get soybeans in the ground. As long as you got them in the ground by Memorial Day, we we're happy. Right? Well, that's not the case anymore, and hopefully you guys have that appreciation. If not, Carrie will bring it home with, you know, switching that up a little bit, okay? But think about those two, and that's going to come into that, that second category of where we're seeing situationally deficient fields of sulfur, okay? Obviously, all these other ones come into play. They're kind of our standards that come into, you know, managing weeds and SCN, weekly scouting, fertility. Clearly, this is a talk about sulfur and soybeans. And then how does that all integrate? So, you know, how does it integrate with weather, right? I've got this in blue for a very specific reason, right? You know, water. Do you guys deal with too much water ever? No. Yeah, yeah, never whatsoever, right? Tiles, I've given this, uh, these kind of talks in the sands, and it's a different topic. It's we need to irrigate, right? But it's, it's water relations. And then how does that interact with your soil? Right? So this all comes into play. This is the management that either you're doing on your farm or that you're helping the farmer with. And the name of the game is just being intentional with it, not just being a rotation. Okay? 
So that's been my big thing for years. Let's look at a couple old lines and to hit a little bit of variety and then we'll get into some of the background information that you need on sulfur. So we, we've had the opportunity for a number of years with an old and new study, old and new variety. So 1923, 1943, 1964, 2011. Just cherry picked a few few varieties from the trials that we've done over the years. And um, what strikes you about you know these varieties? Color. All right. What do you mean by color? 2011 being darker green. All right. So what what do you anticipate? Why is it darker green? So why is this 2011 darker green? They're all at R6 growth stage, by the way. Full seed. So darker green because of what? Nitrogen would go there, right? What else? Sulfur. Today's a sulfur talk, right? So that's a nice little build-in, right? There's a gimme. Straight out of the day. You know, early on when I was looking at our, our nutrient numbers out of this, I mean, it was definitely, definitely nitrogen. We had all that sulfur and everything else, but not until we started seeing sulfur responses, I kind of said, you know, we really need to go back and look at that data. So it is nitrogen. It is sulfur. That's coming into chlorophyll, right? That nice dark green color. That's chlorophyll, right? That's what we're talking about. And if you look at the 1964, uh, so we're talking about, you know, uh, the Williams, the Corsoy, uh, Callahan, the, you know, those, those types, okay? And those have certainly changed. If you look at Iowa State soybean growth and development, you know a lot of that's based on you know Hanaway and Weber, even even you know today, so it's 1971 type. So these these varieties have changed is what I'm driving at, and here's one example of that. Uh, just looking at sulfur accumulation, so I, I brought in three varieties that represent quote the 1960s, and three varieties that bring in uh, kind of the 2010s, if you will, and look at a couple of different fractions: the leaves, the stems, and the pots. Today, all I really want to concentrate on is uh, going to be the orange line. That's going to be the pods that's switching into the seeds. Okay, this is going across the growing season. So we've got that pointer is pretty horrible. All right, so uh, going from V4, so your growing season V4, R2, what growth stage is that? Full bloom, R4, full pod, right? R6, you're fishing, right? R6, full seed, and then harvest. Okay. So let's follow it along. As you go along, uh, we've got this section right here. I can't jump up that high. So at R6, we've got on the order of maybe 55, 60% of our sulfur accumulated in those older lines, kind of the traditional nutrient accumulation curves. And then what goes on to the end of the season? We maybe gain just a little bit more, maybe another 5 or 10%. So we go from that 55 to maybe 60, 65% sulfur accumulation. Okay. Now as you look at the more modern lines, so by R6, we have just shy of 40% of our total sulfur accumulated by this point, okay? And then is it kind of just tailing off and flatlining? No, it's continuing to go on and on in a very linear fashion, okay? So we're accumulating more sulfur at the end of the day, and more of it's going on later in the season, okay? So we go from that 40% up to the 75% in a nice linear increase, okay? So what that really tells you is what month makes or breaks soybeans today? It's late August and early September now, guys. August has been 1960s, what we've always been used to. No doubt about it, we need a good August, but we need those two weeks in September too. It's really late, late August, early September is where we're at. Okay, this accumulation of sulfur is the same thing on nitrogen, the same thing on our biomass and dry weight, so just have that understanding. All right, you think about that leaf color I showed you? That, that's what this is associated with. You know, it's a leaf color, the leaf retention, the leaf biomass, so that we can have this remobilization, okay? So just a nice little time stamp on, on varieties and how those would change, okay? Now we're going to get into you know, some of the basics of where we're getting sulfur from. Uh, some of these cycles are going to be pretty similar uh, as you think about nitrogen, but here IP and I had a nice little uh, cycle for us. So we're going to talk a little bit of what the atmospheric deposition has been like, okay, and why this is now becoming more and more of a topic. Uh, what we're getting from the soil, so the organic uh, material, so again, thinking about low organic matter versus high organic matter. Uh, plant residues, I mean, how many run no-till over here, right? How many run cover crops and no-till, right? So all that's going to come into this play, all right? And then you look at the nitrogen cycle just to catch a few of the similar uh, points. So the organic matter in the soil, uh, plant residues again. So when you think about nitrogen supply in a continuous corn, what are you worried about? Say it again. 
running out. So what do you typically think about needing to do in a continuous corn, especially no-till continuous corn? Probably adding a little bit more nitrogen or thinking about the amount of carbon that's being put in there, the carbon to nitrogen ratios, that's going to start to pull out with these next few slides. And then clearly on the soybean side, you know, the fixation, what's going on there. You know, fortunately, we do not have to fertilize our soybeans for nitrogen. Otherwise, you would be in the fertilizer business, not in the farming business, right? Because we're talking 250, 300, 350, depends on yield levels, uh, pounds of nitrogen that's needed, okay? So putting those two, two together really are what build you know, a good foundation in the fertility side of high yielding beans. All right, so we're going to look at that. So sulfur, who needs it? All right. So the Clean Air Act came out in 1990, the amendment to the Clean Air Act, I'll put it that way. They really started getting to the sulfur emission side of things. So we need a reduced amount of acid rain. Okay. So I, I'm the type that buys a, a used truck, and I want to have it forever. I don't want to have to paint that truck every three years. So acid rain is not my friend. So the Clean Air Act was a good thing, is a good thing. So understand that, all right? Because otherwise we're going to have to paint that truck every four years or something. So uh, even uh, after 10 years of that Clean Air Act, it takes a while for things to, to come up. And I'll do my best with this pointer. I don't even know if you can look at it. But 2001, uh, the uh, wet and dry deposition across the U.S., uh, I'm going to kind of do the corridor here, the south, southwestern Indiana, going into the Ohio and then keep on going up. So at the highest levels in 2001, those regions, we're getting upwards of 18, 20 pounds of sulfur being deposited. Okay? Now you go to the northern part of uh, Indiana, and again, if I get this pointer, it does suck. <laughs> yeah, I can't jump up there either. All right, so I've got a better pointer. But... Uh, so you go to northern Indiana, we're maybe on the order of uh, about 12, 14 pounds of sulfur. You go over where Seth's at in the Minnesota area, so they're, they're pretty low already, right? They're in five, five pounds or less. And actually, they've been doing some sulfur work longer than we have in Minnesota, so Dan Kaiser and the folks out there. So just saying about you know, proximity, locations, right? So the deposition, so we're not getting as much now within our corridor, guys. Now you look at 2015, uh, we're down to that three to five pounds. Okay, so we're not getting any more sulfur for free, essentially, right? Uh, that's just from the deposition. So where else do we get sulfur from? Steel mills, right? Uh, you think about down here in the southern part of Indiana, that's coal, right? So that's where the industry is coming in. Now we brought in scrubbers, right? So we're cleaning out the air. So now there's plenty of gypsum from these, right? That's from the smokestacks. Now it's calcium sulfate, so you're spreading with the trucks now. That, that's how it's going now. Uh, so that's being cleaned up. That's good. Now thinking about it on the fertility side. So again, I already kind of laid out which crops of what we grow in the Midwest. So wheat, corn, soybeans haven't been on the list until recently. Why is wheat at the top of the list in terms of a responder to sulfur? So if we're not getting it from the atmosphere, are we getting anything from the soil? If we're getting it from the soil, where are we getting it from again? Just kind of hitting it once again. Organic. organic matter. How do we get it from organic matter, guys? Mineralization. Mineralization. Oh, there you go. Temperature. When's green up her, uh, occurring wheat normally? Yeah, normally. I'm not going to go this year. Normally. <laughs> about now, right? But think about, okay, it's starting to warm up. Um, warm up. It's not warm soils, it's warming up. So you think about mineralization, that microbial activity of breaking down organic matter for supply of nitrogen as well as sulfur is pretty limited. So you're going out there, if you're doing a split application, uh, you're doing top dressing, you're putting out the nitrogen, you're putting out sulfur, because a lot of these fields just aren't mineralizing enough sulfur. Okay, does that make sense now? So use that knowledge as we get to the tail end about these situationally deficient fields. Those fields that are 4% organic matter and still seeing a response. Okay, just put that in the back of your mind. We'll get there. All right, so wheat's at the top of the list. Usually the grass crops are the top of the list. So again, wheat and corn, uh, sulfur helps in that utilization of nitrogen as well as some other nutrients. So that, that kind of goes in part and parcel. Um, but it's, it is a huge need for soybeans. All right, so here's some good rules of thumb. If you haven't had these in your back pocket, these are probably just some good ones to have for just doing rough math. Okay. So if you're looking at how much sulfur is going to be supplied from the soil, 
know your organic matter, and it's, it's a range. Three to five pounds of sulfur mineralized from that organic matter, each percent. Okay, so there's some, some numbers say maybe two, uh, but three to five is a pretty good one I've seen over the, over the course of time. Now the plant residue side of this, okay? All right, is plant residue going to immobilize or mineralize that sulfur? And again, we want to get to the sulfate form. We don't want to get to the form that the plants are going to take up. All right, I already kind of had a little bit of pitch of the no-till, the cover crops coming into play. Uh, some good numbers, uh, if you're not familiar with these. I mean, carbon to nitrogen ratios, I think we're fairly familiar with. Carbon to sulfur ratios, I don't think that's as common knowledge, okay? Uh, and so again, these are ballparks, guys. All right, so if you have residue that's on the order of uh, 200 to one or less, that carbon to sulfur ratio, so 200 parts of carbon to one part sulfur, that material is probably gonna be mineralized. It's gonna be broken down into the sulfate form, okay? So it can be used. Now as we go into the higher ratios, so 400 to one or higher, now we're talking about the other side. We're gonna be immobilized. That sulfur is not gonna be available for a while. The microbes are continuing to chew, but it's not releasing, okay? So now go to your corn stalks. How much carbon do you have to sulfur in your corn stalks that you're about to plant into your, so your soybeans into? It's between 200 and 400, I'll give you that. So you think it's closer to 400 or closer to 200? Closer to 400, guys. Again, these are ballparks. Corn stover, usually closer to about 350 to 1. Okay? Again, that will change based on what you did the previous year, uh, how well the yield levels were on those corn stalks, or what your weather patterns, all that. These are ballparks. Just hear that. It's not the gospel. All right? Uh, wheat stover, or sorry, uh, soybean stover, just to give you that context, all right, much lower, right? We do not have that carbon footprint, the amount of carbon in that material as corn does. So uh, about a third as much, 125 to 1. You get into the wheat side of things, I mean, you got a lot of straw. This is assuming that the straw stays on the field, right? This isn't bailing it, this is leaving it on. And so about 300 to 1. So we're getting pretty close already on just our normal no-till corn stock ground, right, of immobilizing it. Now let's throw in a cover crop, all right? Which cover crop do you think, which types of cover crops do you think would just elevate this carbon input? Cereal rye, right, or the grasses. Do you think the radish would up that? No. Usually about this point when you're driving past the fields of radish, what do they smell like? Rotten eggs, right? Now, huh, what is that? Sulfur, right? Oh, okay, so now, now you might say, well, that radish is giving me sulfur. Well, okay, it's releasing it, but is it available for the crop? So, again, I'm giving you just thinking through points of this, right? Um, this, this idea of the cereal rye, whether well, that came out in our trials last year, some of these fields that I think are being immobilized, again, another category of being situationally deficient in sulfur. Okay, so put that in context as if you're looking forward to this next year uh, or you've done some of this last year or two, okay? Any questions on those, that basic understanding? Okay. Uh, so how much does that other crop remove? That other crop being corn. All right, just kind of, again, we're, I'm building to this mass balance of things. Again, these are just ballparks based on just an average across the Midwest. Uh, so in the, in the corn itself, I'm picking 180, 220, 260 yield levels. Uh, on a per bushel basis, uh, 0.08 pounds of sulfur per bushel. And you can just kind of do the math from there. Okay, so if you're at 180 bushel uh, corn crop and the grain itself, it's removing about 14 pounds of sulfur. All right, that's what I'm interested in in terms of the soybean crop. Um, but if you're interested in that corn crop, you might want to say, well, how much is needed in total? So basically, it's a double number, right? So about twice as much for the grain and the stover in combination, 0.15. So 180 bushel corn, 27 pounds, 220, around 33 pounds. Okay, so just again, giving you some ballpark numbers to run with on this. Think about what's coming from the air, what's coming from the soil, and then if you need to do anything on fertility, okay, manure, it's got it in there too, so let's get that good balancing act. Now switch it to soybeans. So if we're at yield levels of 50, 75, 100 bushel beans, and we're looking at on a per bushel basis, again, ballparking at 0.18. So we're, we're about double the amount of sulfur on a bushel basis in soybeans versus corn. Why are we double? 
Protein, that's right guys, that's why we grow it, whether we get the full benefit of that, that protein in sales. All right, the building blocks, amino acids, right? So think about there's more power pumped into that, that seed, so we got more sulfur into it, all right? So on a 50 bushel bean crop, it's nine. On a 75 bushel bean crop, it's 14 pounds just in the grain, but that's not what we want to know. We want to know what's needed in the total crop. So the total crop, again, it's about a double, about 0.35. So more or less a third of a pound of sulfur needed for the whole stover in the grain by the end of the season. If you're going from 50 to 75 bushel beans, that's 18 to 26 pounds. Again, this is a rough math, guys. Just giving you the context of what's needed. Okay? Make sense? I'm going to do some back of the envelope calculations just to get us honed in a little bit more. All right, so here's, here's some just rough math. No common core. You guys got common core math in Ohio? No, I can't do common core. It's not common core math, okay? So pretty basic. Same yield levels, 50, 75, 100 bushel beans. Overall need, we're thinking 18, 26, 35 pounds. Okay, now what's coming from different sources, all right? So if you think about, let's say we get five pounds of sulfur from the atmosphere. Uh, so that's the sky, five, 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 right? We got that. Now you, you select your organic matter. And then we'll kind of dial in. So if we're going to pick the metal, it's four pounds of sulfur being mineralized from your organic matter out of one percent. So on that low coarse texture, like you've already set up for us, you know, if we're wanting to say 75 bushel beans, we need 26 pounds of sulfur. Five's coming from the atmosphere. That's 21 pounds left, and then we get another four pounds from that one percent. We're in need of 17 pounds of sulfur. Okay, that's rough math. That's not saying that's exact, right? Because is all of that atmospheric sulfur available on May 1? No. And is all of that organic matter sulfur available on June 1? No. Right? So it's a course of time. All right? So just think about that. Um, and by rights, uh, if calculations are true, you know, I've got a lower yield low of 50 bushel beans, and I got 4% organic matter, I'm in a surplus. You know, right? There are those kind of rough numbers. Okay? So this is kind of where we want to start. Uh, if I had started this talk, that this is a variety selection talk, and showed you this picture, you'd say, yep, those are just different varieties, right? In fact, I showed you the old lines to new that had this kind of color difference. But we're at the point that it's a sulfur effect, okay? So there's plenty of fields that I've driven past over the years that look like the one on the left, okay? It has this kind of off-green color. I'm thinking it's just a variety itself. There's even varieties today that still have that kind of off-green color. Okay, or you go out and there's the demonstration fields, a variety, you know, next to the co-op that's got these varieties next to each other. And that's just what they look like. But that's not the case in this. This is no sulfur. This is 20 pounds of sulfur up front. All right. So I'm going to speak a lot from what I call my playground, where we've identified sulfur deficiency, and then 2018 really exploded out, looking across as far as distribution. Okay, so the playground's where I'm doing all these fine resolutions and treatments to figure out what's best and then build it out from there, okay? So from this side, this is lacrosse, this is up in our northwest, I call it our black sand. So categories of that soil texture is a loamy sand, a sandy loam. That's the two main soil types that we deal with there. Uh, I call it black sand because it's two to two and a half percent organic matter. but still a sand, a loamy sand or a sandy loam, okay? So coarse texture, but it's a little bit more organic matter than you might anticipate with that, that texture. This is 20 pounds of sulfur up front. This is uh, ammonium sulfate, what we used on this one. Uh, this is granular AMS broadcast on top of the ground right after planting. Mother Nature works it in. Okay, I'm going to get into some of these nuances of different ways of managing it. But this is what started. So we had the reference strip, essentially, is what I'm saying, to say, oh, man, we've got something going on here. Let's follow it up. How many have seen those products that get applied at V4, V3, that turn those beans dark green? There's plenty of those products out there. And what do they do at the end of the season in terms of yield? Eh, maybe. So just, I want, I want you to follow this through, right? I've got a pretty striking picture, no doubt. Let's follow through to see if we actually have a yield effect, okay? And we do. But this is the middle of July, all right, in 2016. So we started putting out these trials in 2016 because of a 2015 rescue study, trying to rescue 20, uh, we had 20 inches of rain in June on a few of our fields and trying to bring them back to life. And one of the treatments happened to be ammonium sulfate and we got six bushels out of that rescue treatment. So that's kind of what brought us to this point. Um, so let's get into this. Uh, is there any good soil test, is there any good soil test to predict that we're gonna have sulfur deficiency? No. 
Again, think about it like the nitrate side of things. You know, there is a pre dress nitrate test, right? We don't have anything like that for sulfur. Actually, it's a little bit more difficult to, to, to characterize that. Can you get sulfur numbers from your soil test? You betcha, right? Malic extractable, uh, Malic 3 extractable, uh, excuse me, my cold's getting to me. Malik 3 extractable, we can get that from A&L, SureTech, whoever, right? But th there's no correlations. There's no correlations with being responsive or not. Okay, just understand that. It's mobile in the soil. Maybe over time, maybe over time, if you take these and see that we're still trending on the low, you know, 7, 8 parts per million sulfur, these might be the ones that get close, but there's no correlations as of yet, okay? So the other aspect is if you bring in a reference strip, or if you're taking leaf samples, most recent mature leaf, and as a snapshot, guys, leaf samples are finicky too, but we're just trying to build in what can you look at. So critical level I really want you to point into is about 0.25% sulfur. If you're taking the most recent mature leaf, this is flowering, so R2, uh, the early pod, R3, that's the, really the key point to look at this, but I take it multiple times to see where it is, okay? That number's gonna come back. All right, so let's get into some of our, our shotgun uh, studies that kind of go out everything at once, and then we're starting to dial in more finer resolution. So what I call our sulfur season study, uh, straight out of the gate, untreated, obviously. Uh, 20 pounds of sulfur. This came through a number of different ways. Thinking about how much is coming from the atmosphere, how much is coming from the soil, yield levels, I want to be at least 75, 80 bushel. So at least want to get to that level. And then also I had a, a couple of two or three years in North Carolina where we've had some sulfur responses. And so around that 20 pounds of sulfur is where we started, okay? Now I'll fi find a resolution on that too. <clears throat> uh, brought in AMS, so the granular AMS. And then MES-10. Anyone familiar with Micro Essential 1240-010S Mosaics product? Anyone? All right, so... What's the sulfur? Where is it coming from? Half of the sulfur from the, that mosaic product is AMS, ammonium sulfate. So that's readily available as soon as we have water to solubilize it, right? And that AMS, it's readily soluble. So when you get some water, it, it dissolves pretty fast, right? Uh, the other half is elemental sulfur, okay? So how fast does elemental sulfur oxidize? Slow. How slow? This season slow or next season slow? It's literally next season slow, like 300 days. You can get a little bit. I mean, some of it's occurring during your current growing season, but the full oxidation is go another year, calendar year, okay? So just understand that. These are one and done right now. We're building into, okay, what's the rotation effect to see if we have some BT horizons that might accumulate the sulfur. Uh, we had some of that in North Carolina, about the 18-inch mark. We had some starting to accumulate. But understand, these are one and dones right now, okay? But the th thought process was that MES-10 to have uh, some immediate need and then have a more or less a slow release from that elemental sulfur throughout the season. Okay, so that's where we started um, prior to emergence. And then we brought in the foliar, foliar treatments. All right, so this is five pounds of sulfur uh, using spray grade AMS. Okay, we went out at specific growth stages. You know, I'm like creature habit here, so I like my V4, R2, R4, R6. All right, so R6, again, guys, that's a September spray. That's late, right? Uh, five pounds of sulfur. That's 21 pounds of product. 20, yes, so thank you. There should be a wow there. 21 pounds of AMS. How much spray-grade AMS do you put in with Fexapan, Exendamax? Thank you. None, right? <laughs> None. Otherwise, we have another talk ahead of us, okay? <laughs> How much do you typically put in with a glyphosate spray? Yeah, 17 per 100 gallons. Go back down. It's basically three pounds or so of product per acre. I'm talking 21 pounds of product. Seven times as much. So there's a lot of people say, oh, I've got that going out with glyphosate. I'm good. No, I'm talking seven times as much, okay? This is all nutrient solutions alone. Hear that, okay? All nutrient solutions alone right now. So pretty high rates, and then you think about that hot rate, okay, later in the season when your warmer temperatures, more sunlight, you will get some phyto, okay? So understand that. But this is a starting point. Think about those multinutrients, and Emerson's famous little thing that he wrote out last week in some internal emails with metanutrients, whatever it is, foliar uh, products, how much sulfur are you getting with some of those? Those one, two-quart multinutrient foliar sprays. 
at best a half a pound. At best. Okay, so I'm talking 10 times as much of those multinutrients. Okay, it's a macronutrient that's needed in large quantities. If this is truly a sulfur deficiency. And then we brought in the, those same rates uh, in sequential fashion. So thinking about whenever you're going across the field at a, a V4 burn, a V4 uh, post and maybe an R2 fungicide. Again, these are all nutrient solutions alone, though. So then we had a, a 5 pounds plus 5 pounds. That's 10 pounds of sulfur. Or we did a V4 plus an R4. So again, these combinations. Some people say, Sean, your data says there's a lot more going on later in the season, so I want to do late sprays. So I was like, okay, we'll, we'll put that into this. And then I want to waste your money, so I'll do a V4, R2, R4, R6, 20 pounds of sulfur, right? Four trips across the field, right? So again, just to kind of have this balanced out. Make sense where we started? Okay. So by strictest definition, so here's just some tissue results. Uh, it's from that same day that you had that visual difference in the picture, right? You had the no treated sulfur and the 20 pounds. That's literally the same day. All right. By strictest definition, is there anything deficient? based on leaf samples. If you don't remember, that's the number, 0.25. By strictest definition, no. 0.25% sulfur is the deficiency mark, right? So if you took these samples, sent them to SureTech, A&L, they say, nope, uh, you're sufficient. You're close, but you're not deficient. Again, leaf samples are snapshots. Use them as such. So do multiple ones, get you close. It is getting close to that area as a point of reference. Uh, we do have more uh, sulfur in the broadcast material, so the mesoterm, the AMS that were broadcast on top of the soil, those green bars. The foliar samples, uh, foliar treatments were better. Um, but by strictest definition, there was no deficiency. All right? Another number that you should know, I spent a couple years in North Carolina dealing with uh, nutrient management across the state. Fraser for Christmas trees or blueberries, tobacco, anything in between. And some of those numbers that were passed down to me from the agronomist of old were shown when you look at these leaf samples, uh, look at the nitrogen and sulfur ratio, thinking about the imbalance and the potential of inducing a sulfur deficiency. If anyone's had wheat that's looked off green and you put more nitrogen out there and it's still off green, even more off green, chances are that you had an imbalance of sulfur and nitrogen, so you actually need more sulfur in that system. So the number that was always told to me was 20 to 1. Um, and so by that definition, nothing is cr getting close to that critical level of what is going to respond to sulfur or be a, a sulfur deficiency, essentially. But over the three years that we've done this, uh, actually the number I'm feeling more, more and more comfortable with is if we get closer to an 18 to 1 or higher, we're inducing a sulfur deficiency or you want to put it a different way, we're increasing our opportunity for sulfur responsiveness. Okay. So that untreated, it's right at 18 to 1. All right, so we're right at that level if you're using leaf samples to kind of say, do I have a field that may or may not respond to it? That's, that's the number I would use. Okay? Uh, the other treatments are right within that wheelhouse of so 15 to 1. That's a, pretty, that's a good spot to be in terms of efficiency. Uh, sulfur is needed to help with utilization of, of nitrogen as well as others. Um, you'll see in later slides, sulfur is needed early because it's needed as a cofactor for nodulation. Okay, so then we need to have something that's helping with our nodulation. All right, so that's going to come into play as well. So by strictest definition on the previous slide, we're not deficient by this uh, 18 to 1. Are we getting close to a sulfur responsiveness? Yeah, we're right there. And again, these are pretty crazy numbers, and I'll admit it. I mean, we're talking 12 bushel responses on the playground. Okay, hear that? First year going after this. Uh, so we run from 48 bushel beans. AMS went up to a little above 60. Okay, so 12 bushel responses. Again, this is black sand, so 2.5% organic matter. Um, just going at it at first, first go. Uh, stair step. Why do you think you see a stair step with that MES 10? What's the source? AMS and elemental, okay? And then we just started at 20 pounds. We're, we're fine-tuning this, guys. And then seeing how widespread this actually is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, not enough of it oxidized for that need is what I'm driving at, okay? Still not a bad product. And again, if we bring this into the mindset of is it a rotation, residual, this might be a player into this. We don't have enough on it. The foliar treatments, that's the one that's kind of interesting to me, uh, just to, to catch this. Even five pounds of sulfur, uh, we're six to eight, nine bushel responses. V4, R2, R4, R6, again, that's a September spray, guys. That's a sulfur deficient site. 
I've been there for three years, it's sulfur deficient. That's not saying that every field that you run is going to respond like that. That's a sulfur deficient site. Did it ever get to that highest level? No, on those singles. The sequential, that's kind of interesting to me. This V4 plus R2, that first pink one, got us up to 60 bushel beans. So the potential was if we needed a rescue, we could, okay, in year one, uh, 2016. In 2017, that sequential was so-so. Uh, so really the kind of the end of those kind of first two years of this is needed up front earlier the better, okay? Crazy responses, 12 bushel, 12 and a half. Uh, we did this uh, same year down our southwest part of the state, our kind of our yellow sands down there. Uh, that's about three hour drive for us. And so we weren't able to get our broadcast on until V3. So granular broadcast over the top. We went from 72 bushel beans up to about 78. Uh, the MES 10 AMS were more or less on equal playing terms. Again, think about that as later in development. Uh, so then we didn't get as much of a full benefit on pilot nodulation. Still a six bushel response. The one I would really want to key in on with this site is the R6 and then the all foliar. Why is it no different than the untreated control? Do you think it's hotter down in Vincennes or south of I-70 than up the north, you know, I-80 corridor? You betcha. We got burned. Again, that's a hot freaking rate, okay? So understand that. Also, R6. Are we putting any more leaves on at R6? No. If we happen to get a burn at R2 or R3, we still have some leaf development that we can respond from that, okay, and overcome it. If you get burned at R6, you're, you're getting burned, right? And so that's what happened on that. So, again, full disclosure on that, that spray, all right? So st still pretty responsive. Um, Yep. All right, let's follow through with some of these uh, look like visually. I showed you a July picture. Now let's look at September. All right, so off to the left is the no sulfur, uh, September 7th, 2017. Uh, to the right, literally right next to it, is our 20 pounds of sulfur. This is again on our playground. Um, so what do you notice about this picture? Should be leaf color again. What do you think that's associated with? Nitrogen as well as sulfur, right? So again, these are the sulfur treatments. Um, these are treated up front, okay, at planting or shortly thereafter, but having a cascading effect all the way to September. Why? I gave a, a quick little side note. Sulfur is needed as a cofactor for nodulation, okay? So the nodulation have an effect on what? Nitrogen, right? Nitrogen and sulfur in the leaves, Leaf retention, this is all coming into play, right? We're building into the root systems as well as the leaves themselves, so they're retaining their leaves much longer in the season, later in the season. The one on the left, that's the nesting, guys. That's, that's shutting down. The one on the right is still holding on. It's still filling seeds, okay? So when we start to break apart where this yield is coming from, it's coming from branching. It's coming from more, more pod. It's coming from bigger seeds. All this is coming into play, all right? So let's follow it through. Uh, here's the root system. Off to the left is AMS root system nodule load. All right, and off to the right is the untreated. Even in this kind of uh, brightly lit room, you should be able to tell the nodule load, right? So what we haven't done is dig up every plot and look at the total numbers. This year, you know, we took leaf sam or took uh, whole plant samples to look at the concentration of uh, three fractions of nitrogen to hopefully. Uh, shed some light on what's coming from nitrogen fixation, ureides, what's coming from the soil, um, maybe fertilizer of ammonium and, and nitrate. So we're starting to hopefully start to tease that apart. But just this nice visual, that's the same day, same plots that we're talking about. So the untreated that was starting to snest, it makes sense, right? You don't have a nitrogen supply, okay? So when I get asked, John, that AMS, is it a, is it a nitrogen effect or is it a sulfur effect? My answer is yes, right? And now we're starting to work through, okay, is it a yes from the fertilizer nitrogen or is it a yes only from the nodulation and fixation? I don't have that full answer yet, guys. But seeing something like that, boy, that, that should give you some pretty good pause, right? So this need for the nodulation and fixation. Uh, follow that one through the harvest. Uh, we've got pencils off to the left. We've got, uh, some may, may say on the right, that 20 pounds of sulfur that's starting to lodge. Uh, that looks horrible. No, that's actually branched, and that's, that's a difference of 12, 13 bushels, what that is. Uh, off to the left, you've got maybe one lower branch with a, a reproductive pod on it. It's only got 17 nodes versus 
Uh, the 20 pounds of sulfur, we've got two reproductive branches, so they're potted up well, half, over halfway up the plant and a second one. Uh, better node development. Okay, all this is coming into play. Again, thinking about when it's applied and it's needed earlier, it's helping with the branching development and that decision to branch, that nitrogen supply, all that factoring in. Okay? On a sulfur deficient site. 2017, uh, again, it wasn't a, a one year fluke. Uh, 2017, 13 bushel responses from those granular applications. So we went from uh, higher yield levels. We went from 60 bushel beans that year to 74, 73, 74 bushel beans. Okay, so it's not just a lower yielding, it's a higher yielding environment we're seeing it. Uh, foliars were okay. Again, they still did not get to the same level of just having that upfront sulfur. Okay, uh, four to seven, so it, it did rescue them. Uh, the sequential, as I alluded to, wasn't nearly as good in 2017 as it was in 16, so uh, I wouldn't count on that to rescue it to the fullest level if you have that need. Okay, So that's kind of the first step. All right? uh, we started with 20 pounds of sulfur, but is that the right rate? Right? Uh, so we did a rate response study at the same location. Again, this is as good as we can get for right now. We'll keep on moving through. Uh, so 2016, 17, we did 5, 10, 20, 30 pounds of sulfur. Okay, three sources, uh, AMS, MES-10, and then I brought in my own blend. Uh, so basically just Tiger's Elemental Sulfur and then AMS to kind of have something to match up to with uh, the MES-10 product. Okay, so three, three products to look at with this. Uh, we did balance everything with phosphorus, so the triple superphosphate, so there wasn't any, any uh, you know, advantage to the MES-10 product. Okay. So that's where it came in. All is done broadcast over the soil uh, within a few days of planting. All right, and this is kind of where we're at over those two years at one location to be a starting, plot, starting block. So uh, to lay this out, uh, sulfur response uh, is on the bottom, 5, 10, 20, 30 pounds of sulfur across the bottom, yield across the, the left axis. AMS is going to be our, uh, our black circles. MES-10 is going to be our uh, blue squares, and Tiger AMS is our triangle. So rate response. I mean, again, I can't make this data up any better. Uh, break point, if everything's optimal, okay, if everything's optimal on the 65 to 75 bushel beans was 10 pounds of sulfur, okay? That's with AMS. Uh, you push out with the MES-10 to about 20 pounds of sulfur. Tiger's right there as well. So as you look at this all the way through, uh, AMS break point's about 10 pounds. If you're looking at a MES-10 or a, something with a blend of elemental, uh, much higher rate, again, if you really think about it, though, they're all the same if you think about what's soluble within there, okay? So 10 pounds of sulfur from the, the soluble source, sulfate, is, is really what was optimal um, at this site, the, those few years we had it. AMS, that was 10 pounds of total sulfur. The other products were twice as much because they have uh, that elemental component. Now, is that what's needed across everything? You have to bring in some other factors, right? This is 2% organic matter. Does this, this rate change if you're a lower percent organic matter? Does this rate change if it's higher? Does it change if you have higher yield levels? So we're, we're talking mid-60s to mid-70s on the top end. So if we had higher yield levels, this might go up. This is just our starting point. So the way I've really been using this data is say this is your bare minimum if you want to look to see if you've got this response. My reference strip is still 20 pounds of sulfur, just to make sure, because how many times are we going out and applying at the perfect timing? I took a picture yesterday, boys, of a fertilizer applicator going. Okay, how many times are we applying at the perfect timing? Snow was on the ground, right? So understand that this is at the most perfect timing on these yield levels in this, this soil condition. Uh, if we do other sources or if we do it a month earlier and it's a soluble source, there is going to be some movement, so just understand that. Okay, but I think this is still some pretty good information to start moving forward. Uh, in 2018, we uh, we saw enough of a consistent response. I said, okay, let's put a little bit more effort into other sources. And so uh, in 2018, we brought different sources: AMS and MES-10. Visually, were the ones these two here. These were the ones that would continue every plot I could peg. I mean, I didn't have to have a treatment map. These are the ones that pulled out to me. Uh, they were taller, more node development. They're uh, Root system was a, a better root system, so expanded out a little bit more. Nodulation, I'd say, might be a little bit better there. And so kind of giving me a little bit, we might have a little bit of a fertilizer nitrogen effect on this. I, I'm not 100% on that yet. But what's causing me a little concern is that my ATS here, so ammonium thiosulfate, didn't do anything for me, right, in terms of visually, in terms of visually. 
Um, so the only thing I can think of, okay, you got maybe half as much nitrogen that could be playing into that. Uh, but it's just first year going after it, and we'll keep on. The other products, gyp, uh, that's gypsum, that's pelletized gypsum. Okay, uh, we use the sulfur four plus product, not the boron version, but just their their version. Uh, KMag again by rights, uh, gypsum, KMag, ATS, those are soluble forms. Those should have the same response level of a MES-10 or AMS, should, visually, if it's just a sulfur need. Uh, so AMS and MES-10 visually looked like they were the winners on that. Uh, when we came into the yield, untreated control last year was 62 bushel beans. AMS, MES-10, uh, were 10, 11 bushel responders again. The one that kind of uh, caught my eye was the gypsum. It was still right up that 73 bushel mark. Okay, so visually, the plants themselves on the gypsum plots didn't play out for me. Um, but then, when it came to yield, and that's what it counts, uh, those were at an equal level to the AMS and MES-10. So just given some options, all right? Uh, the ones that are, I'm scratching my head still on is the KMAG and the spray ATS. So those are 69 bushel beans. Uh, still decent response, but not to that 10, 11 bushel response. Uh, I've talked with some of the suppliers on that, and, and we're all in agreement that that should be at the same yield level. I mean, they're soluble enough. So maybe a, just a fluke in that, that year. So we're going to follow it up. not saying that's, the, that's how it's always going to break, that, break down or rank. But that's where that, that one year went. Yeah. Yeah, so the gypsum, everything here on the sulfur sources are at 20 pounds of sulfur. 20 pounds of sulfur. So I'm not, say that again. Broadcast, broadcast everything broadcasts on the soil. Mother Nature works it in. Yeah. Would it make sense to put in uh, this nitrogen product to see how much nitrogen is doing uh, Yep, no, great question. So does it make sense to bring in nitrogen to see if that does anything? On a separate study, not in this slide, said I did that. And it did, I brought in, my source was urea, and I was comparing that with AMS. I compared it with AMS rates at planting and at R2 and a split, uh, the urea by itself, and then adding urea, uh, none of it played out. The, the extra nitrogen using urea did anything for us. It was still a sulfur. Um, and, and to kind of get to that point, this gypsum, you know, that's calcium sulfate, does not have nitrogen, so then that's another play for me to say that this is a sulfur effect, and if it's affecting nitrogen, it's on the fixation side more so than a fertilizer end on this scenario. Okay. Say it again. Uh, are we inoculating the beans? On this study, it's just a fungicide insecticide seed treatment. We did an inoculant by AMS uh, treatment at our prairie site, so uh, West Lafayette of Wanatal. Uh, there's no interactions on those sites uh, we've looked at in terms of the inoculant doing more for us on its own or doing even more with the AMS. Uh, those same treatments, uh, same sites. Uh, the AMS was a uh, four bushel response at our West Lafayette prairie soil. And then uh, up at Wanata was three to five. So, yeah. Uh, we just started in 2016 when the first year that we started looking at it. Yeah. And so, and maybe I'm, I'm reading your mind a little bit. We rotate to a different part of the field, so we're not going back to the same spot to see if they're residual. That's, that's what I want to start this year is go to corn, soy, start rotating, and see if we've got that residual effect. Is that where you're going? That's, that's, that's what's going now. Once that we've seen enough response, I'll put more effort and energy into it. Good questions, guys. Uh, the spray ETS, I mean, this is one I'm hopeful. This is seven gallons of ammonium thiosulfate. We brought in eight gallons of water, 15 GPA broadcast. Thinking about, okay, let's hit it when we're doing burn down so it's not one more trip across the field. Again, this is all nutrient solutions alone. There are some antagonism issues with certain herbicides, so let's, let's understand that, guys. Um, but hopefully something will play out so we don't have to do an extra trip. Uh, the foliar spray at R3, it, again, that's a sulfur deficient site, so it's 69 bushel with just five pounds of sulfur. The Tiger 90, is, so that's the elemental source, all right, so slowly, slowly becoming available, oxidizing, so maybe if you want to put hardcore, you know, fine numbers, three bushel maybe. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. We'll continue those uh, this year at that site as well as other locations. Um, I'm doing decent on time. Foliar rate, you know, I kind of picked five pounds of sulfur just because I want a pretty good, nice comparison with 20 pounds up front. But is that what's really needed? All right? And so my, my reference strip right now is that pre-AMS of 20 pounds of sulfur, granular AMS over the top. 
Then we did foliar sprays V4, R3, and then the combination. Rate response using that spray grade AMS. One, two, four, six pounds of sulfur. So if you thought 21 pounds of product was hard to dissolve, try going up to the next level of 26, 27 pounds. You know, that water's got to be pretty hot for that thing to dissolve. <laughs> okay, My crew loved me those days. Uh, 15 GPA rates is what we're talking about. And again, this is at the playground. Uh, rate response, so uh, V4, first year doing this, and a rate response, four pounds of sulfur was a break point for us. Uh, R3, the rate, uh, break point again was that four pounds. So I did pretty good. I didn't need a data boy or a pat on the back of picking five pounds. I was pretty close, guys. Okay, pretty close. Um, again, for a point of context, if you're looking at those multi-nutrient uh, packages of one, two quart, that's the rate that they're talking about quarter to half a pound, right? You're not going to pick that up. If sulfur is needed, those rates are not going to touch it, okay? If sulfur is needed. Uh, and then data is data, right? So then here's this combination, uh, sorry, the combination of the pink V4 plus R3. I've looked every which way on these plots and not sure why, but I don't see any reason why I need to throw them out, so it just didn't respond. So those happen to be linear. My guess is once we do it again this year, they'll start to break out like you would anticipate. Okay? If I was to be naughty and just uh, cut out that, that rate right there, mm -hmm. uh, those four points would break about the similar four pounds of sulfur. Okay? But here's the, the long and the short of it. If, uh, if you're doing the least sampling to, to bring it back to life, I mean, four pounds, I mean, three to four pounds is where you need to be. Okay? Spray grade AMS or another. I've done KTS. That's a great product. You just got push numbers on the economics, right? Uh, KTS, uh, potassium thiol sulfate does well. Um, but the pre-AMS, again, that reference was 69 bushel beans. Uh, we were on 64. We still did not get to the yield level of what just having that upfront AMS. Okay? Understand that. So the last five minutes or so, I'll get into these situationally deficient uh, fields of sulfur. All right? Timely planting. So I already made the comment about wheat, cooler soils, right? Limited mineralization, it's going to be responsive probably to sulfur. What are we doing now with soybeans and timely planting? Earlier, okay, 50, 51 degrees soil temp, I mean cooler soil still, right? And so this is where some of these fields are playing out that would traditionally would not be a sulfur responsive site, okay? I saw three years of data of a company in Illinois that we're seeing some pretty crazy numbers. 10 to 12 bushel responses to an ATS in a two inch offset place. And I kept pushing these guys, so when are you planting these? They said as early as possible. So okay, when is that? And it was April 10th, April 15th, right? So that started to build into, okay, limited mineralization. So we brought into the, uh, this year study looking at early versus late planting. Uh, this is at our prairie site, and so our West Lafayette, 4% organic matter soil. Uh, May 11th was as early as we could get there this year because we had snow every Sunday in April, right? That's as early as we could get. And then basically about a month later, first week of June. I'm only going to show you a few of these nitrogen and sulfur treatments because of today's time. Uh, May 11th, planting untreated control with 62 bushel beans. Our AMS kind of referenced 20 pounds of sulfur application. Uh, seven bushel response to 69. Uh, our ATS, that foliar, uh, or excuse me, that broadcast at seven gallons of ATS, eight gallons of water. Okay, now I'm starting to get a little excited. I saw upwards of a nine bushel response there. This was before emergence, so uh, pretty decent. I get 4% organic matter type soil. You go to the later planting date now, 59, 60, 62 bushel. There ain't no yield differences, guys, on that later planting. Okay, so these situationally deficient fields. Cooler wet soils is kind of one of the areas I'm driving on this, limited mineralization. The potential, the potential that it might have a, a starter-like effect. You know, well, there have been starter trials on, on soybeans for years, and pretty much they're nil. Well, how many of those have had a sulfur component to that? So that's, that's the next step. We're building in those starter trials with sulfur this year. Uh, but this gives us a decent understanding, uh, or at least a, a anticipation of what might be occurring on some of these fields that are earlier plantings, even on heavier soils, okay? Uh, another one to just uh, make life even more frustrating for us all is, uh, well, about the variety impact, all right? This is up at Wanatha, this is in northwest Indiana. It's a loam soil, about 3% organic matter, uh, about 20 miles away from that playground site. Um, didn't get planted until May 25th, so more on the later side, guys. 
Um, the 24X7 was a four bushel responder to AMS, and the 34X6 was no response. So I'm just throwing another one, okay, maybe variety interactions are playing in. I don't have enough to confirm that, but just I just want to muddy the waters for you guys, right? Um, infield Advantage, so our on-farm demonstration program, the state uh, the Department of Ag and Indiana Soybean kind of support, they picked up on this basically yes, no uh, of AMS, and so they had a little over 100 fields last year, and I'm just starting to get some of their data. Uh, had them take leaf samples at R2, R3, and so based on their untreated, so we've got maybe one site that's, quote, deficient. If you're just using leaf sample, that's not the best and only way, but just give you a ballpark. If you're using that kind of 18 to 1 ratio, of their 100 or so fields across the state, maybe a third of those could be responsive. Okay, Just put it in context, guys. Right? I'm not saying every field is going to be responsive, but this is a, a part to start. Uh, we've had some ag retailers who replicated trials I met with about two weeks ago, and they're, they're breaking down our traditional course textures are the ones that are more responsive. Uh, upwards in those double digit numbers, but still even the heavier ground, maybe three or four pound, three or four bushel to five bushel. Uh, here's one I alluded to earlier. So cereal rye was burned down about two weeks ahead of planting, uh, and then the field is finally fit to plant. And the question they asked me was, okay, should I plant or should I play that AMS card? I said, you plant. <laughs> you plant timely. We can deal with AMS later or whatever soluble source. We can go into V1, V2 and still get a pretty good response. And that's what they did. So they burned down, they applied, uh, planted the first week of May, and then came back about V1, V2. Um, it was 80, 80 foot swath, 60 acre field. And I went after a field day in August to do some counts. And these are okay looking beans. They weren't great. Uh, if it was just a field of them by themselves, I'd say, yeah, those are pretty good. But having the 80 foot strip right next to it, where you get these monsters that are taller, more node development, more pods, darker green, uh, looking awfully nice. Field average with the yield monitor across that field went 73 to 84. Okay, so this might be one of those cases again where okay, it had a little bit more carbon input. This is three three and a half percent organic matter soil, guys. Okay, so this is playing this out. Again, I'm showing you a lot of the pauses. There, believe me, there's some no responses as well. Okay, so here's the concluding thoughts. Soil test? No, not really. You want to think about soybean as your integrator, so either having a reference strip, like this 20 pounds of sulfur I'm talking about, with a soluble source. Okay, AMS is by far the one I've done the most with. It's pretty good. Mestin's there, again, understanding that half of it's elemental. Gypsum's not bad. The, the ATS, I think, could. I just don't have enough, so just take it for what it's worth. Um, do not be doing that on uh, live tissue. I haven't done that work, but I would say that we might get some burn. All right. Uh, if you're using leaf samples, a, a snapshot in time, look at our critical levels. Are we getting close to those? And then the nitrogen and sulfur ratio for an 18 to 1 or higher, okay, that might be a responsive site. Um, if you're going into foliar, we need to be a little higher rate, 4 pounds of sulfur, of sulfur, not of spray grade AMS, okay, so 15 pounds of product. And then look at this combination. Is there any management by fertility interaction? So the timely planting, heavy residue, uh, cover crops coming into play. Right? So this is kind of where we're at right now. It's not saying it's every field, but I feel pretty comfortable that we need to still at least look to see at the distribution of this and then to move forward. Think about those other characteristics of why you might not see a response. Anyone run manure? Okay, think about it. If you're putting one ton, two ton of chicken litter uh, every year, and you got some swine manure into that, you got to build this into it. Are you putting any sulfur on the corn side? How much? You, so put that all in the context, guys. All right? Any questions on those and what we've seen so far? Yeah. Yep, so the question is about uh, that dry spread, are we using potassium um, as a carrier? Right now, everything's on the, the fertilizer itself all by itself, so AMS all by itself. So if we think about an applicator, if that's all we're doing, 80 to 100 pounds of product, that's about as low as those applicators can go. So that's kind of another step as well is, okay, if we're going to do a, an April spread uh, with potash, and AMS, okay, again, what's rate? Because that AMS solubilizes, right? Or if we do a MES-10 type product and, or whatever it is. So, no, we have not done that combination. I know a lot of people want to do that because then maybe I can do 50 pounds of AMS, bring in my potash, but you're a month or so or two months ahead of planting. Okay, then we got to worry about what, how much is solubilizing or not.
Okay. In that scenario, so he's talking about putting a potash out when beans are up and out of the ground. Uh, I'd say you probably could. I haven't done it. You probably could do that. Uh, I, the sulfur's needed on the earlier side, so let's make sure we're V1, V2s so we can still get that benefit. Uh, I would say I've done some high yield studies where we, we did one and a half X uh, potash rates to really make sure that we weren't limited there. Um, be careful if you're doing a high rate of potash, like right after planting. I've seen some suppression of yield, on, I think from the chloride, I'm not 100%, but it's such a high rate, we actually had about three to five bushel yield suppression on those higher potash rates, and I'm talking 120 pounds of K2O, I mean, so pretty high rates, okay? Good question. Yes, sir. You uh, spread like a ton of gypsum per acre every so often. You're getting over 300 pounds of sulfur. Yep. You're going to need 20. Yep. How much and how long is all that extra going to be available? Yeah, so the amount of that gypsum, and again, so that might be a reason why some of the responses have been kind of nil over here, is um, if you're putting a lot of gypsum on every other year or every couple of years, I mean, that's, that's a lot. There's a lot of sulfur there. And then you got to think about the different soil profiles. Of, okay, the sulfur is moving through the soil, but then do we have, I don't know all your soils, but have some areas of accumulation. And so there could be enough there. So I dare say those that are typically doing the one ton of gypsum, fairly regular, are probably not going to be a site that's responsive. That's how I'll just put that. And let us thank Sean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>